Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast, where we explore the exciting science behind heart rate variability. The material discussed in this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Please check with your medical provider to make sure any suggestions or strategies are right for you. Visit us at the OptimalHRV.com website to learn more about the Optimal HRV app, download a free copy of Matt's book, Heart Rate Variability, and also get show notes and additional resources around heart rate variability and its applications. All right. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Today, I am going to be your host, Dr. Dave Hopper, um, and Matt Bennett will be taking the night off today. Um, and I have two very special guests with me today. I have Randy and Alicia. And Randy and Alicia are both students of mine. They are in the pre-doctor program over at National University of Health Sciences. Um, so they will both be doctors here very soon. And um, and Randy, Alicia, what I'd like to start off with is an introduction of both of you and uh, tell me who you are, where you're from, and uh, what maybe uh, something like what motivated you to want to become a doctor and specifically both of you are going to become naturopathic uh, doctors, so doctors in naturopathic medicine. Um, so let's, uh, let's kick that off. So uh, Alicia, let's start with you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Alicia Johnson. I'm actually from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I came all the way to National University to go to school here. Um, I have a background in actually starting in allopathic medicine. Um, I worked in the hospitals and ER and trauma for a while, for about four years. And then when I graduated college, um, I ended up taking a trip to medical internship trip to Thailand. And that's actually sparked my interest in holistic medicine. So when I came back into the States after spending there for like three months, um, I was looking for, I was in the process of applying for my MCAT and applying to schools. And then I was also looking for holistic medicine. And then I ended up finding naturopathic medicine. I shadowed a doctor back home and I loved it. So, and I have an extensive family background with like GI and gut issues. So that really wanted me to pursue naturopathic medicine even more. Awesome. Awesome. And I, and, and these are two of my star students as well. I do have to say. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Yes. And, uh, and Randy, please, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Randy Grinter. I am a National University student now in Tri-3 um, and loving the program so far. Um, I'm originally from Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, and I moved here um, in middle school, so I've been living here for about half my life, and um, honestly, the proximity was an amazing appeal to going to the national. Um, what got me started in alternative medicine in the first place is um, likely just my exposure. I've always been around uh, homeopathic physicians and chiropractors my whole life, and um, starting in a high school, I knew I wanted to do something in the alternative medical field uh, like them. So um, national is kind of the obvious choice. And um, I guess even broader than that, um, I'm a Christian and I've been a Christian my whole life. And I feel like that's one of those driving motives for me to study holistic medicine compared to uh, allopathic medicine since it, since it gives a greater like view of the body as a whole um, and how I believe God created it. So I really enjoy learning about it, especially uh, such intricate details like HRV um, and the research we've been doing here. So yeah, that's a brief background on me, uh, all the important little details. That is awesome. And, uh, it, and, and Randy, within that, I don't know if you've heard the, the saying, let the power that created the body heal the body. Have you heard that one? I Not specifically, but I've always uh, heard it referred to as God is the greatest physician. So. Uh, Indeed, right? Our, uh, our body has the ability to heal itself. Absolutely. Um, and that is what I, both of our, uh, you know, whether naturopathic medicine, um, you know, is aiding in doing or chiropractic medicine. Um, either way, what we are doing is, uh, is allowing the body to heal itself to the best of its ability, right? Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing uh, seeing that change actually happen. Um, so now what I'd like to talk about today is, uh, is that 
you two have begun helping me with a project and I, uh, and heart rate variability is obviously a, a very favorite topic of mine. Uh, so Alicia had emailed me, oh, uh, probably about six months ago at this point, maybe, maybe not that long ago, maybe four months ago. And, uh, and she asked me the strangest question. She said, Hey, you talked about this heart rate variability thing in class. And, um, and I was curious about, uh, you know, about that in relation to her mindfulness work that she had been doing in the past. Uh, and I was so excited that she emailed me about that. Um, and I believe it was on a weekend uh, and I was, uh, I forget where I was, but it was somewhere. And I, I was very intrigued to continue emailing back and forth with her. And, uh, and then ultimately asked her to uh, help me out with some of my research that I wanted to start. Um, so, so Alicia came on board that way. And then, uh, and then Randy is a, uh, is a very inquisitive student and, uh, and has, uh, has a real awesome uh, brain. I, I just have to say, uh, getting, getting the chance to, to talk with you on a regular basis, uh, it challenges me, which is really cool. Uh, so so I, I enjoy that. Um, and, uh, and you were very keen to jump on and, uh, and get going with some research as well. So it was, uh, it was great to, uh, to have, to get the opportunity to continue working with both of you. So now both of them have, uh, obviously passed my class and, uh, and they are on to bigger and better things. Um, but I get to still communicate with these two. Um, so being that both of you had very little exposure to HRV prior, that's something that I wanted to ask you about. And then additionally, you know, Alicia, I know that you had, um, it, you had a lot of exposure to mindfulness meditation and that kind of stuff prior. Um, so I'd like to just take, uh, you know, your background kind of, uh, where you were starting at, where, where your starting point was with, with HRV, with mindfulness, uh, with meditation and where you are now in that journey, uh, what the research process has brought you to thus far. Obviously, we're pretty new into the research, but, um, but you both have done and learned plenty uh, at this point to talk a bit. Yeah, I think um, for me personally, so I started off doing yoga. I've been doing yoga for about five years now consistently. Um, and then I also matriculated into doing meditation because of yoga. Um, I had saw a significant difference in just my mood, how I would wake up in the morning, what I wanted to eat for my body. And I think from then till now with me doing HRV, it's, I get to actually see the effects that it does have or like how significant it is if I don't do my meditation or if I don't practice my resonance breathing, breathing frequency, how it really does offset me maybe for the next day or something like that. So it's, for me, it's interesting to see what I've practiced in my home for so many years come into life clinically. Um, and how that affects me. I think that's so like the best thing about meditation right now in HRV. Very cool. And, and indeed it will show you those, uh, those, those positive effects that you have when you are doing your, uh, your RF breathing and when you are, uh, and when you are doing your, your good meditations uh, and sleep and everything else. Right. Uh, so, right. so very cool. And, uh, and Randy, how about you? Yeah. So I'm entirely new to the whole HRV meditation mindfulness like game. I, um, the reason why I mentioned the Christian aspect of my life, um, because it's my grounding, like um, the grounded part of my life uh, that I have. And my prayer life has always been like my meditation in like certain terms, um, but I've never done mindfulness, breathing, pace breathing, HRV um, stuff. So that journey has been super fun to like, uh, explore the avenues of, um, of breathing and, and like improving my cardiovascular health, which I've actually noticed recently, like having started this within the past like month or so, um, I've actually started to notice like my breathing patterns, like become more accustomed over time. And like, um, just overall, I feel much more like happy after I run through my breathing cycles. So I, I don't know. It's just, it's been a fun journey so far and I'm really excited uh, about where it's taken us. Well, uh, very cool. And you had mentioned in an email that, uh, that this was becoming a new addiction for you. Yeah. Um, and, and what, I, what aspect were you referring to specifically? Is that just uh, the, 
the RF breathing itself, uh, resonance frequency breathing, I should say, but I guess all of it. I mean, the breathing itself gives you like that runner's high. I don't know how to else to say it, but it's mm -hmm. that same like feeling as like when you run long distances, which I can't do very well. So I love it. <laughs> um, but there's that. And then there's just the like tracking portion of it where you can like track all your numbers and you want to see where you're at for the day and how you're uh, feeling for the day and like how it translates to your life in general. So yeah. I don't know. It's just big old addiction that I got now it, it does become addicting and I'm, I'm glad that you are addicted to uh to taking your HRV and to doing your RF breathing and without a doubt I you know I know I personally um you know get get a similar feeling uh you get into you know quote unquote the zone uh when when you're doing your breathing and you just feel amazing uh you know and that's uh that's the, the best way to put it um so can you guys both share uh, something? So with our research, what we're doing right now, and I should, uh, I should tell everybody um, what we are beginning to do. So we want to put together a, a research study uh, with our university. And what we want to do is take students and run them through, um, run them through essentially a, a trial, right? So we're going to have kind of a group of students who is doing RF breathing um, on a daily basis. And we're gonna have a group of students that, uh, that is not doing uh, RF breathing on a daily basis. And we are going to have everybody uh, taking their HRV on a daily basis. And what we wanna see is the changes in the students throughout a trimester um, as they go through this. Um, so you two at the moment are being uh, the guinea pigs for that, uh, for that as well. So right now, both of you are taking your HRV daily and, uh, and, you know, and I can, I can see what you're doing on the back end, And, uh, and I can see that for the most part, you guys are taking your HRV uh, every day, uh, and then doing your RF oh, breathing. There's, this is not violation of HIPAA laws. We gave him permission and all that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's what we are. That's what we are looking at. And right now, what we are, uh, what we want to see, is, is how HRV is going to change uh, in a student throughout a trimester. As you go through midterms, as you go through finals, um, what do those stressors look like? And then, what is the impact of doing RF breathing um, on a student as they go through? midterms as they go through finals and other various stresses that are going to uh, going to come into play on a student. Um, so, so right now, both of you are going to, uh, are going to wind up being uh, individual case studies for, uh, for, for this. And, um, and you are doing your own research, right? You, you are being essentially your own subjects within the research and, uh, and I'm kind of guiding you guys through that. Um, so that's what we're looking at, but can you tell me as you've been reading through the research and learning above and beyond what you're doing in your curriculum, um, what are some of the most interesting things that you found in regards to heart rate variability, resonance frequency breathing, um, any of it? Okay. Randy, you want me to go first? Sure, yeah. go further. Okay. So I got a long deal. <laughs> so I've been focusing more on the meditation and mindfulness side in comparison to HRV. And um, I think the most interesting thing that I have found is different types of meditation techniques will invoke different types of cardiopulmonary um, responses. And so with that being said, um, one type of meditation is called Vipassana meditation um, and Zen meditation. And they were both known to increase high frequency, meaning more parasympathetic tone. Um, and then also there was another part of meditation called deity, deity tantric, and it was actually known to decrease um, high frequency and actually increase low frequency. Um, I can kind of compare this to a different article who did a study on a different group of students and they measured their mind awareness and attention through a mind awareness attention scale and people, and they ask them about more so like, how do you adapt to certain life exposures? Um, how, how often are you able to keep up with the task? And if you were able to score higher on the scale, meaning you were more self-aware, more self-attentive, you actually had a decreased 
frequency, a lower frequency. And I thought that was interesting because if I have a lower frequency or lower parasympathetic tone doing the Vipassana meditation, which increases that parasympathetic tone would be able to correlate that or help those students who are in school. And so I actually took it upon myself to, I looked up the Vipassana meditation and I've been practicing how to do the meditation. And um, it has shown like significant changes in my RMS D compared to when I first began till now. I know when I first began, I was in like the eighties, the nineties, and now I'm, I'm at like 134. 140 sometimes. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so it's amazing. And I actually feel a difference with my body and my awareness and, um, I get better sleep as well. Um, and so, um, the biggest thing with Vipassana meditation is it focuses on insight of your thoughts, but not being attached to them. And so one study discussed how concentration meditation has less of an influence compared to insight meditation. And um, with insight meditation, such as Vipassana, you would get into a meditation state. And if there was a thought that came up in your mind and that was bothering you, you would give insight to it, be aware, but make sure you throw it out immediately after. And you would continue on with the next. Instead of focusing on concentration meditation, which is more about stillness and sitting in it. Um, and so I think with that research, and then also looking at how the mindfulness awareness attention scale, you can see how an a, a detachment of thought, awareness of thought, but a detachment from the thought can actually help people's parasympathetic tone and decrease anxiety. Um, and then they also found like with the scale that, um, with studying females, they actually had a higher um, frequency sometimes. And this was also affected with like their menstrual cycle. And so it was found that um, in the high follicular phase, they had a higher frequency parasympathetic tone. And then in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, you had more of a sympathetic lower frequency. And um, a lot of more studies are showing that the menstrual cycle along with HRV when we're studying students should also be considered too, because it has such a significant effect on blood pressure and heart rate. So yeah, I think that's what, I think that's the type of research I'm getting more into now is how does this mindfulness affect and help women who are also in this menstrual cycle state too? And they've shown significant changes as well. That is just mind blowing. Uh, I, yeah. uh, that is, well, first of all, I need you to, uh, I need you to spell out the meditation for everybody. If you could do that. Oh, yes. So Vipassana, um, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. -S -S okay. And, uh, and I'm assuming that there's, if, if somebody were to Google that, they could find like a, uh, a guide on how to do that meditation, correct? Yes. Um, I actually was able to type it right into YouTube and there's tons of videos um, that can instruct you on how to do it. And that's how I started as well. Okay. And I uh, and that change in your HRV is just unbelievable, though. To see your RMSSD score go up uh, from you said eighties, nineties to one thirties now, is that correct? Yes, yes. The only time that I did see a difference in my RMSD was actually when I got sick recently, and um, I woke up one morning and my RMSD. I felt a little off, but my RMSD was about I want to say sixty five, fifty around that at the time, and. Um, I didn't realize that I was sick just yet. And then later on in the day and then into the next day, I was down into like lower 40s red. Um, and so yes. that was kind of interesting to see how our, your heart rate variability could pick up that as well in the body. Yes, indeed. Uh, picks up uh, up to two days prior to the onset of symptoms. Yeah, um, wow. yeah so it's uh, it, that's very cool. I, and um it, yeah, and you ended up being uh, fairly sick for for a little yeah. bit there, right? Um, um, yeah, about five days, five, five days, four or five days. Okay, and were you able to watch your HRV recover throughout that too? Yes, so today was actually the first day. Um, so yesterday it was 80. Today was the first day that it was back to 140. Okay. Today. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. And, yeah. I, and I can feel the difference as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good yeah. question then. Were you continuing this mindfulness um, throughout your sick period also? I was. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I made sure either I will say when I was continuing the mindfulness and my resonance frequency breathing, it was a lot harder for me to breathe as I was doing it because yes. I was so congested. But the more that I did it, the more I noticed that my sinuses actually opened up and it helped as I was doing the meditation and um, the breathing frequency. So it was interesting to see how my body worked with HRV and the meditation because it's it's so great and it can it can really over change and change the trajectory so I really liked it yeah yeah that, that is really cool and forcing yourself to to push through like that too is that right is, is huge um but you see you see what happens when you overcome uh right. and then um I also did want to go back uh to that as well because you had mentioned um you know the tie-in with the menstrual cycle and everything um, which mm -hmm. is such an inflammatory process within the female body. Um, and, mm -hmm. and watching that change, um, you know, and, and how that is affected by HRV as well um, is very cool. Uh, so are, are you open to sharing how you see, uh, how you see a change in your HRV uh, when you are nearing and on your cycle? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm completely fine with that. That's okay. Um, so for me, I've noticed when I am nearing my cycle, I'm a lot more agitated. I'm a lot more anxiety filled. Um, and my HRV, the, it does regulate a lot around that time. What I have done and also being a, natu a naturopath and knowing, you know, what my body needs, I've been able to even change my diet around that time while I'm taking my HRV because I'm noticing that it's changing or it's going a little bit lower than usual. And I'm a little bit more agitated. I can even change my diet, eating more like fruits and vegetables into my diet at the time. And that actually helps um, me throughout the week. And I actually don't experience a lot of agitation or the PMS <laughs> that we normally get during our cycle. And it also prevents from like, um, craving food craving eatings as well i've noticed yeah. that too i don't food crave eat a lot at all yeah that is so great uh you know and, and it and helps with the infl inflammation as well i forgot to mention that um i don't feel like the bloating and the swelling as much either and i imagine you know, brain fog and mind. whatnot too then mm -hmm. all right okay well, that is, uh, that is awesome. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, women listening who would love to hear exactly what, uh, what that protocol is that you, uh, that you go through. Um, and that would, that could be an entire other episode in itself. <laughs> I'm um, actually excited to research more into that side and how that mindfulness helps with that too. So I look forward to that. Uh, well, well, that is so cool. And I, uh, and thank you. Um, and actually, before we go any further, so Rainy, I do want to make sure that we have time to uh, to get onto some of the interesting findings that you've had. Um, but for for people listening who might not know, uh, what is a naturopathic doctor? Uh, what what exactly do you guys do, and uh, and how does that tie in uh, with with all of this? Or or just define what a naturopathic doctor is for me, please. Um, I guess I can start with a little bit. Uh... Uh, context. Whenever um, I think of naturopathic doctor, um, I always reference it to people as like the natural MD, which doesn't quite do it justice or service, but it's the best correlation I have um, for people that I talk to because um, we're fully trained primary care physicians. Um, we have all the training and background that our counterparts do uh, in the allopathic world, but um, I love um, how it's supplemented by using natural um, modalities, natural therapies, as well as uh, natural principles um, in order to better treat patients holistically um, with the mindset that, as you said, Dr. Hopper, um, they can heal on their own. And our job is to encourage that and help it thrive. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and that picture you can add to it for sure, because that didn't cover it all. No, no, I think you said it perfectly. Um, I think the best thing also about being in, becoming an ND, being a naturopath is also, you not only get to learn about natural medicine, but you get to learn how to heal yourself in home too. Um, and your patients get to take that as well back home. So they actually get to learn about their body. Yeah. That's a good point too. I, I love that part of our like line yeah. of work. It's great. I think that's the best part, yeah. For sure. Yes, and giving the power, right? Realizing that it is right. 
that it is right there in their own hands uh, for, for sure. Um, but, but that, that's it. Uh, you know, just a, a natural way. And that is, um, you know, I, I very much dislike the, uh, you know, quote unquote alternative uh, medicine label um, because th this is the original medicine. Um, you know, that is, that is food and, uh, and things that are naturally found within our environment. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's very awesome what you, what you both are doing and going into. Um, and, uh, and Randy, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Uh, what is something unique that you've found so far in your research? Yeah, um, so my research has primarily focused around HRV and biofeedback, which uh, falls under the category of pace breathing, uh, deep breathing, resonance frequency breathing. Um, all those fall under the biofeedback uh, system as part of HRV biofeedback. Um, just as a side note, this isn't to be confused with uh, neuro biofeedback, which is a separate field that has to do with more uh, MRI technology, more um, e-stim technology, like actively stimulating nerves. Um, the research I have done is focused more on breathing and natural um, accommodations to increase your HRV um, above what it is uh, at the present. Um, so I have this, um, this really cool connection that I found and I'd love to share it with you guys if you'd uh, not mind me talking for a little bit. Uh, I got a little soapbox I'm gonna stand on for a minute. Please do. <laughs> So um, the most interesting part of my research has been in the neuroscience area and how we can track HRV breathing functional um, results that we can see in our world and feel as we do HRV and biofeedback, as I was talking about with the runner's high, the great feeling you get after um, meditation or breathing. Um, we can trace that back to a physiological connection and be able to really see um, scientifically and empirically the effect our actions have on our body. Um, so the best study that I found that did this was a study that looked into functional MRIs, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And it took that and added it to resting state functional connectivity of the brain and tracked that in relation to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So as they were analyzing that, they pulled on research coming back from um, 1993, um, early 2000s. And that research that they were building on was based around the idea that the central autotom autonomic excuse me, network links the several regions of the brain, including the limbic system, the forebrain, uh, prefrontal cortex, frontal cortex, um, as well as the brain stem and all the nuclei associated with it. They took that research and basically built on it in terms of a uh, visible um, and tangible way. So just as a brief um, overview then, those regions of the brain that um, I'm talking about in terms of autonomic control include the cingulate cortex, the anterior insula, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It also includes the uh, medial dorsal thalamus, amygdala, hypothalamus. And if you have um, any experience with these terms, um, you probably are uh, seeing some connections here with where I'm going, where uh, you have some sympathetic components, including the hypothalamus and the hypothalamic um, pituitary axis, as well as some parasympathetic components, um, including the ventromedial prefrontal cortex associated with um, the vagus nerve. Uh, of course, as we all know, vagus is the wandering nerve and it literally does everything in viscera, uh, including control the heart, the lungs, and all these systems we're so deeply interested in. I just have to uh, pause you for a moment there and just, uh, oh, and just say how proud uh, Dr. Jenkins would be if she were to listen to this and, uh, and hear how well you paid attention in neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. <laughs> So, uh, yes, but, uh, but please continue on. <laughs> oh, for sure. Those are my favorite courses. So when I found yeah. this connection, I was like, I, that little kid inside of me really started like freaking out and it was great. Um, anywho, um, all these areas of the brain are like the higher level areas that we uh, talk about in neuroanatomy. And so connecting those to the heart, then we see the connection via the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, both of those under the control of their respective nerves, um, the parasympathetic specifically, the vagus nerve, 
um, implementing its control over heart rate variability and heart rate in general too. Um, so I'm gonna connect this now for the neuroanatomy portion and then I'll get to the functional MRI results because you kind of need both to understand it. So another article I was reading uh, that tied into the cardiac anatomy um, in terms of vagal uh, input into the cardiac cycle explained how the vagus nerve influences um, the heart and its um, pacemaker through the sinoatrial node. And that in addition with the atrioventricular node, um, just to give a brief aside in terms of cardiac anatomy, the pacemaker of the heart is the sinoatrial node that travels its signal to the atrioventricular node that then goes from the uh, bundle of His to the Purkinje fibers to the actual myocytes in the ventricles and cells and causes ventricular contraction. All of this is a really coordinated system I've really enjoyed learning about um, in terms of how the atria contract first, then the ventricles, and then um, this all um, pushes the blood into the lungs and out the heart. Um, and that all is actually controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic input. So as I was saying, the vagus nerve inputs on the sinoatrial node, which is the start of the heart's pace. That input is um, via the GERC channels, uh, G-coupled protein. Um, it, it's G-coupled protein um, internal uh, regulating. Let, let me look it up just so I can get you guys actually. G-protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channels. Now that took me like five times fast and I still couldn't get it out right. Um, Basically, it inputs a signal onto those uh, channels that goes to the normal G-coupled protein pathway that um, we know is the uh, trimeric, heterotrimeric uh, protein, um, where the G protein, GTP, uh, GDP, is bound to the trimeric uh, subunit, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha subunit ends up getting cut off as GDP is um, phosphorylated to GTP, that goes and does its own uh, separate function within these channels. But the actual important part is the beta and gamma subunits. The, the G beta and G gamma are combined still, and those will actually go out and influence the ion channels for potassium. And as they go out, they're influencing those channels, uh, also modulated by uh, PIP2, PIP2. Um, there's no chance of me pronouncing that right now. So uh, if you're interested, look it up. Um, but uh, it goes there and modulates those ion channels, which then send potassium ions actually outwards. And that helps um, repolarize the membrane. Because um, as we know, um, in order to get contraction and uh, signal across, we have to depolarize the membrane. So the membrane gets depolarized by the sympathetic nervous system via uh, cyanide HCN channels. Uh, so the sympathetic modulates it via um, depolarization, causing contraction, increasing the stimulation. The parasympathetic always seeks to slow it down. Um, and I'll get to that point in a minute also. So via these channels, it's able to help repolarize the membrane, um, as well as at the same time hyperpolarize it in order to uh, modulate the sympathetic uh, input coming in because the worst thing we could have is the scales tipped one side or the other, parasympathetic or sympathetic, because balance is really the key um, to this whole system, which is um, fascinating to me. I, I love learning this stuff, as you guys can probably tell. Um, so to get that balance, the parasympathetic has to inhibit um, the sympathetic stimulation of these um, cells. And myocytes. So as all this is taking place, um, sympathetics increasing, parasympathetics inhibiting. Well, the parasympathetic inhibition is actually visible from what we can tell by, by HRV and other mechanisms. Um, the inhibition itself actually shows during the exhalation phase. So parasympathetic activity is modulated during the exhalation respiratory phase, um, and sympathetic is stimulated when you're inhaling. And that's just one of those uh, observable details in HRV. Um, I've really enjoyed seeing the little graph go up and down as I inhale and exhale. Um, and it's nice to be able to put like a physiological context to that, you know? But when you're giving focused breath, absolutely. Uh, you can watch that literally go up and down, uh, which, is, which is so cool. 
Um, it, and I do want to say, I, you are referring to all of this happening within the heart, because you started off with a lot of stuff happening in the brain, and then we right. got into what is going on in the heart, uh, just in case we lost anybody, because uh, because that was a lot, uh, and, and we got we got deep into the science there for a, for a moment there. So I want to make sure that everybody knows we're talking. We're still in the heart with that. That's great. No, I'll go back to the big picture real quick. We are in the heart. This is sinoatrial nodal um, uh, anatomy right here, and then physiology. So vagus nerve coming onto the SA node and influencing the rate of contraction, mm -hmm. um, particularly during exhalation phases. Um, the brain comes into play actually in modulating those vagal oscillations. So the vagus nerve oscillates in a pattern tempo in order to basically provide a like stable arrhythmia to this whole process. And it's kind of paradoxical to say because the heart's not beating at a regular 60 degrees per minute. Um, it's beating at like this constant frequency and variation um, that HRV measures. But the oscillations of the vagus nerve both increase and decrease as a function of these cortical areas in the brain, providing the signal on what the body needs to do to accommodate various system changes. Um, so that's the big picture. And then um, the inhibor inhibitory effect then comes in during the exhalation phase. That's where we see HRV actually increase. And this is where I'm getting to the functional MRI. HRV increases, but the heart rate decreases. Now they took this functional MRI, traced it back to those cortical areas and said, hey, what if we looked at HRV, took a measurement of the MRI, um, both prior and after the treatment, which was an eight week long process. So five days a week um, for eight weeks, these people were um, going through their treatment protocol. And at the very end, we have both the before and after picture of the brain and what the connectivity shows in terms of um, cortical, upper hierarchy areas, and then the lower hierarchy vagus nerve controlling the actual heart directly. Um, so I thought that was extremely interesting. And I know Zoom's about to time out on us right now. So I'm gonna try and wrap this up. Um, so those cortical areas came down and then they saw that correlation. Um, other articles tie this in uh, that I found to a short term also, like you don't necessarily need to be doing pace breathing resonance frequency over a long period of time. Even five minutes showed um, an increase in HF, the high frequency, as well as uh, slight increases in RMS SD. Um, but the RMS SD was kind of long-term in nature rather than short-term. So. There's a bit of ambiguity there in terms of the uh, ideal um, process. Um, and yeah, so they were able to connect it via the MRI, which I found super fascinating, connecting the cortical areas to the heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to leave it at that for now because uh, we only have a minute and a half on the well, clock. Well, it, so that, that is so cool, though, to see, you know, the, the big picture connection uh, between how, how your brain and heart directly interact like that. Um, and, uh, and, and when you look at that too, so it's not even so much your, um, you know, when you talk about respiratory sinus arrhythmia, um, it's not even as much your, your sympathetic nervous system kicking on is that that sympathetic nervous system is always there. It's that your vagus nerve is backing off. Um, so that's where we say the, uh, your vagal break is coming on and you see that, um, and you see it allows the heart rate to speed up. Because intrinsically, your heart rate is going to beat faster as a result of that, uh, of that sympathetic, of the sympathetic inputs and just the natural rhythm of your heart. Um, but I, but when that vagus nerve is applied, right, that vagal break is applied, that slows it down to that normal rhythm. Um, and then we can get into how the the breathing is going to affect that as well. Um, and uh, and I'd love to talk about thoracic pumps and how all, all that works within the respiratory centers and cardio uh, and cardiovascular centers within your uh, with in your medulla uh, too. Um, but uh, but yes, we are uh, we are we are right at our uh, time limit. Unfortunately, um, let's say that we continue this conversation on a uh, on another time. Uh, so so thank you both so much.